for this special part of the day when we have our keynote address and our keynote speaker, and I'm here to just have a few brief introductory remarks for our speaker. He's asked that less is more in terms of his introduction, so we're going to make this less than 30 seconds. Chris Inglis comes to us after almost 43 years of public service the last eight of which were as the Deputy Director of the NSA, and that is the top civilian position at that organization. He was a pilot in the Air Force for over 30 years, has had an international assignment as the U.S. liaison to the U.K. government. He has asked that um, I highlight his thirst and his zeal for cyber education, and the last two years or so he's been teaching cyber education to uh, young men and women at the U.S. Naval Academy. The one um, issue that he's also asked me to highlight that he feels passionately about is the value of international partnerships, which we see here in abundance here today. So with that, Chris, I will turn it over to you, and I will say thank you so much for honoring us Great. today. Thanks, Chris. 30 seconds. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, I do have a presentation that I'd like to give. I'm going to use some slides, but I'm really not going to read the slides so much as use those to cue some thoughts, some ideas. There'll be some pictures in there, which hopefully will give us a sense as to where we are at any moment in time. I realize this is the death hour and that many of us perhaps are living in other time zones and that over lunch we may perhaps drift to the right or the left. I'll take no personal offense at that, but I'll try to move around a lot to keep us busy. Um, when I was first given the offer, the opportunity to come here and, and understood about what the purpose of the venue was, what the location of the venue was, um, it was a very exciting possibility for me because of two things. One, I have a passion for what this conference is all about, which is the development of the talent that will cause our societies, plural, to prevail, to prosper in the, in the years to come. Um, as you'll hear me say, and I think as a resonant theme from this morning's panel, um, we often think of this problem as one of technology. We then think of the solutions as being technology alone. I don't think that's the case in any way, shape, or form. I think as in so many other human endeavors, it's the human being that's at the center, and it's the human being that needs to be at the center of the solution space. The second part of the equation that caused me to give an enthusiastic yes was the venue. Um, here, the hospitality, there's none better. And I can think of no nation that has taken um, kind of the reins in hand to drive its future from the ground up from an educational perspective, a holistic perspective, um, unifying what we in the states call the private sector and the public sector. Um, those distinctions um, aren't quite the same here, but they're profoundly um, unified here. And I find that to be an excellent venue to have a conversation of this sort, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, given the challenge that I've got, which is over the death hour to say something meaningful about cyber, um, I went to bed last night knowing that I was going to wake up this morning and have to talk about something complicated, something that's on the tip of everyone's tongue, something that, as we would say in the States, is above the fold on page A1. And when I woke up this morning, my dreams had conflated that with an explanation of <clears throat> the phenomenon we now know as the Republican primary. You can imagine how relieved I was when it came back to me that I only have to explain cyber. <laughs> and so that's what I'll stick to is my knitting the cyber and hopefully the questions and answers won't get to that larger phenomenon. Um, at some point in my past, I was a pilot, a pilot in the United States Air Force. I flew transports, C-141s in their day, C-130s um, in their day. Um, and there's a favorite story that I have about C-130s, which I think has um, an, al an analogy in this uh, regard which is that it is possible to take a look at first-order symptoms, first-order phenomenon, and come to the wrong conclusion about what's happening strategically in that domain. And the story goes like this. There's a four-engine airplane, C-130, imagine, that takes off and it's making its way across the ocean. Um, kind of lumbers up to the altitude that it's going to actually make the transit at. It's expended a lot of energy to do that, and at that point is now kind of in the coast phase. Um, probably committed to the destination, it's too far from the origin to turn around. Um, and at some point um, in this journey, the airplane loses an engine. Engine just fails. The pilot does what he's supposed to do and then makes an announcement to the passenger and the crew that you may have noticed we lost an engine, but that's okay. That's why we have four engines. We've already exhausted most of the need to kind of apply energy to get to an altitude. So it turns out at this point in time, we're perfectly safe. We'll just fly a little bit lower, a little bit slower, and we ought to get to our destination just fine. Maybe a little late, but just fine. As luck would have it, as bad luck would have it, against all odds, a half hour later, a second engine fails. Pilot does his duty and says the same thing, which is, that's why we have more than one engine on this airplane. We'll fly a little bit lower, a little bit slower, but we'll get there. We'll be fine. We'll be safe. 
as, as the most improbable circumstances um, would allow. About an hour later, they lose a third engine, and the pilot says, look, I know that that's very concerning, but it turns out we can actually make it on one engine. We'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower. We're already at altitude, so don't worry about that. At which point, one passenger turns to another and says, well, I hope the last engine doesn't fail because we'll be up here all day. <laughs> We make the same mistake when we look at cyberspace and we conclude based upon what we see what the extrapolation of that phenomenon means across the larger enterprise. And I'd like to tease out, much like the panel did this morning, which I thought was an amazingly great panel, um, a very diverse set of perspectives that were complementary, not the least bit divisive. Seeing the problem from different angles and combining those views gives us a view that's quite helpful to the solution of that. So what I'd like to do in my presentation today and then we'll go to question and answer where you can help me explore that further, um, is to do two things um, up front, which is first to tease out what I think are the salient characteristics of what we describe as cyberspace. Now, in my view, cyberspace is a noun, right? To some, it's a verb. To some, it's an expletive. Um, to some, it's, some it's, a, it's a reason to break eye contact and not have a further conversation. But I'd like to describe why I think cyberspace is what it is, what its salient characteristics are. Second thing I'll do is to then tease out what I think the implications of that are, what the implications are for anybody that has a vested interest in cyberspace. And it won't surprise you that I think everybody has a vested interest in cyberspace. Having done that, I would like to then talk about what perhaps some remedies, some solutions are that cut across various perspectives, not just the technology perspective, but a few others as well. So without further ado, um, I'll proceed. Oftentimes, when you say the word cyberspace, what is conjured up in the mind's eye is this mix, this flotsam, jetsam, this mix of technology and wires and pipes and software and people and geography all thrown in. It's not an altogether helpful description because it doesn't give you any ability to figure out what you would touch, what you would affect, to do anything about that. That's usually where the conversation ends. That's where people break eye contact, and no further useful discussion ensues. So I'd like to stand back and, from a technical perspective, tease that out a little bit and talk about some constituent pieces and then come to some conclusions about what that means. So it might be helpful to start with this. When I got started at the National Security Agency back in the middle 1980s, uh, this was, in fact, what we called the telecommunications domain in those days. It's what actually was the foundation of what we call cyberspace today. It was on the one layer um, a bunch of devices. Now, all those devices didn't exist in 1985. They would have been fax machines, telephones, telegraph machines in those days. And underneath that, a bunch of pipes, wires, conduits through which information flows. In those days, it was an eminently manual affair. Right? In order to get some piece of information from one place on the planet to another, a human being literally dialed a telephone number, um, would have to kind of pick up a phone and perhaps uh, kind of voice, voice activate some transmission. But the stuff that we communicated in those days left a sanctuary on one side, went across that pipe to a sanctuary on the other because a human being commanded and controlled that. What then happened in between is that we came up with a sufficiently rich set of devices, computers, servers, routers, and a sufficiently robust set of pathways along which that information could be communicated that we virtually introduced this middle layer, this thing called the autonomous layer in my, in my depiction, whereupon the system of these pipes and wires and devices began to take off from us, offload from us, some of the responsibility for figuring out how a communication got from one place to another, sometimes storing a communication in the space itself, waiting for somebody on the far side to say, I'm now ready for it. The system began to not simply reflect things of value that happened in the outside world, but it began to actually store those things of value unto itself, which then get, begat a further transformation, which is we began to reflect things of value only in this space. Ones and zeros became bank accounts in this space. Ones and zeros became the only place where we stored a secret, perhaps a blueprint, perhaps a diplomatic secret in this space. The space took on a very, very rich set of characteristics that offloaded the burden from human beings to figure out how and when and where the information would flow from one place to the other. A transformation ensued. Now, standing back and trying to understand what then transpired, um, how we then began, began to store wealth and treasure in this space, how we began to have dependencies of things in the physical world on this space, 
who began to imagine that that then might be at risk because adversaries would at the same time take advantage of that connectivity, take advantage of that possibility that they might reach into the same space and do ill with the materials in that space. And we began to try to apply solutions to that space. Forgetting one thing, which is that in this space, there are in fact bookends known as the human beings on the one end and the geography on the other. And that those bookends, like every other domain of interest in human affairs, actually have more to do with what happens in the space in between than the technology or the activities in the space itself. That if you need to understand, want to understand what happens in cyberspace, you need to understand the humans on one end, who essentially are a large dynamic of how the space operates, to what purpose it's applied, and perhaps a source of malfeasance or mischief, and the geography of the other, which is typically where jurisdictions lie, that is where authorities are brought to bear to try to bring some order and discipline for the common benefit. But in the main, cyberspace is all of these things. Cyberspace is the people connected to devices which make use of that technology, connected ultimately to the geography on the far side, and all of those together are what it takes to understand how cyberspace works, what it really is. The challenge for many of us, me particularly, um, kind of having been raised in a world where we think horizontally on any one of these layers, is to now begin to think vertically, to connect a person to a device, to a pathway, to a geography, so that we can reconcile people to jurisdiction and everything in between. But so many of the solutions we bring to bear in this space only think horizontally. A technical solution to some tactical problem, a human solution to some perhaps local jurisdictional issue, a geography answer in terms of what we're going to do to perhaps constrain an activity within a geographic boundary, not realizing that in an age of fading, fading borders right, that that simply can't work. And in order to solve cyberspace, we need to think vertically. We need to connect all of these together. But that's not the only thing that's going on. At the same time, we have some overlays. I already talked about the technology. And just as a reminder of how profound that transformation has been, within the United States last year, there was a survey done of the top 1,500 countries, or 1,500 companies by revenue, as to what constituted the nature of their business how inventory um, kind of dependent were they, how much were they dependent upon their ability to manage inventory that's not under their control. And of a surprising nature, 20% of those companies said that at the end of any given year, we report no inventory whatsoever. We have no inventory. Our business is entirely about kind of creating logistical streams or creating kind of a, a way to connect demand and supply outside of our literal control. Think, too, about the kind of companies that now are all the rage, the companies that seem to be looming largest on our radar screens. The largest taxi company in the world owns no taxis, Uber. The largest accommodation provider in the world owns no hotels, no, no, ho no hotels or accommodations whatsoever, Airbnb. The largest media right, company in the world right, actually generates no media whatsoever. Right? That's Netflix and so on and so forth, right? I don't mean Netflix in terms of the company that sometimes produces television shows but doesn't have any theaters. And when you think about the nature of business in this day, and you think about the dependencies of other institutions upon this, this notion of cyberspace, transformation has occurred by virtue of the technology. But there are three other overlays that are going on at the same time. The second of those overlays, not actually independent of the first, is there's a new geography. And the new geography would say that people increasingly today organize not just by proximity or physical proximity to a person or an organization or a nation state or a community is the means by which you identify, you rally support, you perhaps combine those efforts to achieve some common cause. But increasingly today, people organize, organize by ideology. Now, to be sure, that can be a hugely good thing. There are mass movements that occur across the Internet between people who will never physically meet each other that have an enormous and powerful great good um, for, the, for the planet. But there are also um, things that occur across the Internet that are not helpful. Um, we think about radicalization and the rise of lone wolf terrorists as being a phenomenon that was unknown before the rise of the Internet. We think about insiders inside of a company who might use their insider privileges to do harm sometimes because they're affiliated with an entity outside that company and that radicalization of a gentler sort but not a benevolent sort essentially motivates them to do something they wouldn't have otherwise done. This new geography isn't something that is to be pushed off. We can actually take great advantage of it but it's a dynamic overlaid with the old geography
that must be taken into consideration when you try to figure out what are you going to do about cyberspace. The third overlay that's up here is the social trends. Now, these social trends have been with us since the dawn of humanity. These are social trends like a disparity in wealth and treasure, a disparity in respect that might be um, attributable to a belief system like religion or to a belief system like a form of politics or a way you govern um, a people. But those disparities that used to be reconciled in physical space are now increasingly reconciled in cyberspace. Why does Iran attack the United States for 200 days across 2012-2013, attack its financial infrastructure because of this disparity that Iran believes exists between the respect accorded to it, it's probably a different word that they would give to it, but the respect accorded to it by the United States and its allies and the respect it believes it deserves. And its means of reconciling that disparity is now to attack through cyberspace. Why does the nation state of North Korea attack Sony Pictures? Very unusual pairing in terms of aggressor and victim. Why do they attack Sony Pictures in and through cyberspace? Because of a disparity in respect. Right? You do not disrespect the great leader and get away with it. And North Korea has a hard time reaching Sony Pictures physically, and therefore they do that through cyberspace. The final overlay is not independent of those, which is geopolitics. They continue apace. Geopolitics being what it is, nations compete. Nations collaborate. Nations sometimes compete to the degree that they become contenders, perhaps even combatants. And those reconciliations, which used to occur in physical space, and almost always were confined to adjacencies, right, physical adjacencies, now increasingly can and do take place in cyberspace. The point is, is that the technology revolution is not independent of these other three overlays, some of which are fueled by the technology revolution, but the big point is, is that cyberspace is a way to reconcile all of these. Cyberspace is a venue where all of this happens at the same time. If I could summarize then those two points, I would say that my definition of cyberspace is that it's not just a pile of technology, it's certainly not a commodity of technology that we should treat like the motor pole and say, why don't we just get that right so that we can get on with our business. But cyberspace is so complicated because it's actually the overlay, the meld of three things. It's technology and people and process. And because those three things are atomically bound to each other and constitute this place we call cyberspace, cyberspace the noun, we have to imagine that if we're actually make any positive difference in the way it works on our behalf, that we have to actually address all three of those. You can't just address the technology. You have to address the people components and the process components. And the process components include you know, what are the procedures, behaviors that you expect of people? What are the roles assigned to organizations? What are the relationships between nations? You have to solve all three of those in order to make any meaningful difference. Now, to be sure, I'm bullish on the Internet. I'm bullish on cyberspace and its prospects for continuing a transformation of a very positive kind between and among societies on the planet Earth. But I'm also, like the panel described this morning, quite aware that adversaries seem to have stolen the march on us and that the attacks are on the rise. And their success, the attack's success, is also on the rise. And that this is at great risk. I think that while we often worry about a cyber Pearl Harbor in the United States, that's the kind of the, uh, the catchphrase for a surprise attack, a dramatic surprise attack, the real concern that I think we ought to have in this space is that there's a slow rot in the house, that there's a slow leech of our resilience and robustness to the point where we'll wake up one day and come to the conclusion that this is no longer, the flame is not worth the candle, that this is no longer worth the kind of confidence that we ought to have and we therefore will eschew, push away the benefits of cyberspace by reverting back to some manual strategies about how to conduct these um, human affairs. That would be a poorer day and I don't think that that's necessarily the outcome that we need or we prefer. But if that's the case, that cyberspace is the meld of these three, and that we have to solve all three of those in order to get where we want to go, the question would be, how are we doing at this moment in time? I have a pithy answer for that. Um, while there are best practices in various places that you can take a look um, under the covers to see how we're doing, my general characterization of how we're doing as a global entity is that in the realm of cyberspace, we're often found defending the wrong thing in the wrong time, holding the wrong people accountable, hysterical about the wrong thing, and committed to the wrong goal. Otherwise, I think we've got a pretty good thing going. I think we're in a really good place. Now, now that deserves an explanation. 
And what I've just described, if those are the pratfalls, if those are the things that we're not doing quite right, those actually cover the range of technology and people and process. All three of those are implicated in the answers I just gave to the test question of how we're going. Let me walk back over some of those, though, to kind of give a better description of what I mean. When I say that we defend the wrong thing, we grew up in this domain kind of thinking of this as a pile of technology within which there were perhaps some particular actions or transactions that we would find acceptable or unacceptable. And for every one of those, we applied a tactic or a technique to perhaps remedy that. That then grew us into a place and time where we were defending perimeters, we're defending links, we're defending operating systems, we're defending abstractions of the things that really mattered. And in my view, the things that really matter in this space are the data, which is the embodiment of the wealth and treasure, or the infrastructure on which that data runs. But we found ourselves over time, because we got there stone by stone, tactic by tactic, essentially dealing with this through soda straws, trying to figure out how to tactically take care of each thing that occurred, and not standing back and perhaps thinking about the broader strategy. I'll come back to that in a minute. When I say that we defended in the wrong time, that same experience over time caused us to say, look, we're always going to pursue the primary function, the primary feature in our development of technology. I want the next version of the iPhone. I want the next version of Microsoft um, operating system, Windows, or some other entity because of the features that it actually advertises as its primary function. And, and the things that we constitute as resilience, robustness, integrity inside of that, well, if it doesn't come along in the first instance, that's okay. I really want the primary features. We'll catch up, right? The security will catch up later. And because of that, we have found ourselves in a situation where we say we have to experience an anomaly before we're then prepared to deal with it. Think of malware. Think of virus detection software. It's a good thing. It knocks down a lot of noise. But it does so based upon the premise that you have to experience it once in order to install it in the system and defend, you, defend it against it the second time, the third time, the fourth time. My question to anybody in the audience would be, who wants to go first? Right? Who wants to actually suffer the first calamity so that you can then contribute your experience right, to the collective whole and ensure that that thing never happens again to somebody else? Summarize those two things. We defend the wrong thing in the wrong time. We today have a strategy oftentimes that says we have a series of tactics that defend an abstraction of the data that matters, not the data itself, but an abstraction of that. We defend it in post time. It's a transaction focus. It's a tactical focus. When what perhaps we ought to have is something that says, let's defend the data. Let's defend it in real time. Let's defend it such that we understand the behaviors that are happening in the system, not merely this pile of quantitative transactions that occur around its periphery. And in so doing, we fundamentally turn security on its head and say that we need to think about this as a human endeavor, a behavior-based endeavor, and one that's in real time so that we can steal the initiative and the audacity from the adversary, reserve it for ourselves in a system that we believe right, is defensible and is well defended which causes me to introduce the notion of security. I thought there was a great discussion of that this morning about what is it. Um, and I would say that whatever your definition of security is, when I kind of was born and raised, when I grew up, um, I actually first five years at NSA, I was attempting to build secure systems. I worked with Jay Smart, right? And we were actually trying to mathematically prove that a system with certain properties had those properties, provably, and no other properties, provably. Turns out that's easy to do, until a human becomes involved. Once a human becomes involved, all, all bets go out the window. All cards, right, you know, kind of are blown off the table. And so our, our dilemma was, how do we create a system that is never touched by a human being? Turns out you can't get there from here because it's a useless system. But when it was all said and done, we came to the conclusion that security is impossible in the absolute sense. And that what you really want is a system that is defensible and well defended. Which caused me to remember an analogy from my aviation days Whereas when I first was kind of brought into proximity of airplanes, you know, some wise sage um, pilot said, um, one thing you need to know about airplanes and the design of airplanes, because you'll get to kick the tires and perhaps um, approve one later in your career, is that the opposite of stability in an airplane is not instability. We used to think that. But when we determined that the opposite of stability was instability, we firewalled ourselves to the stability end and we built airplanes that essentially were bricks with wings. They were so stable they could hardly fly. Right? They were completely unusable. We came to the conclusion later, and you can see this in aviation design in about the 1930s, that the opposite of stability really isn't instability. The opposite of stability is maneuverability. 
And therefore, we began to see those both as great goods in tension with one another. And we therefore biased the design towards maneuverability. As a matter of fact, today's airplanes, to include commercial airplanes, are built primarily to be maneuverable. And then you impose controls on those, typically using software, sometimes hardware, to bring it back into a range where it's got sufficient stability. But it's a fundamentally different design concept when you think of those two ends of the spectrum. In a similar way, I think that in the range of cybersecurity, if we think that the opposite of security is insecurity, as designers, we're then hard pressed to imagine why did those people time after time after time do this insecure thing? Don't they know? Aren't they thinking? They should bend themselves, prostrate themselves at the altar of, of technology. Well, that's not what a user's thinking. The user's not thinking that at all. The user thinks that the opposite of security is convenience or usability. And when a user pursues what we, the designers, think is an insecurity, they're actually just trying to use the system. They're trying to actually pursue its convenience aspects. And as designers, if we think about that as two great goods, we'll try to find that sweet spot in the middle. And in the best philosophy of design, we'll design both of those in at the start, such that you can actually make use of the system in a way that's inherently defensible. And then we have to actually defend it. Now, the other things that I said were that we not simply defend the wrong thing in the wrong time, but we hold the wrong people accountable. When I say that, I mean that we do sometimes consider that this is a pile of technology. The technologists created this boon to mankind. They also created the problems that came along with it. And we delegate to the technologists the problem of solving these problems, solving the risks that are, that are incurred in cyberspace. Well, that's an impossibility, because the technologists aren't the ones who take the risks in this space. Now, they might build. They might build software and hardware that is inherently hard to defend. They should be brought up to some standard, some conformity. But most of the risks in this space are actually introduced by humans or the procedures and therefore are well wide of technology. And even if it were not true that that were the case, the technologists live downstream from the operators, who are the ones that are actually engaging right, the world that includes both opportunity and risk. And they're the ones, therefore, that are driving the calculation of risk. And if those are delegated to the technologists, there's going to be a latency, a time lapse, before the technologists understand what risk has been taken and they attempt to mitigate that risk. They'll be in a continual tail chase. The answer to that is to not somehow lower or, or shorten the gap between the time the risk is taken and the time the risk is mitigated, but is to move the responsibility from the technologists to the operators for the assumption of risk that the operators, kind of in the civilian world, you would say the chief operating officer, the board, the chief executive officer, they're the ones that actually have to be the responsible for not simply determining the nature of the business, the environment of the business, but the allocation of that business to technology and people process, and the assumption of risk in so doing. Now, they're not going to be technically expert enough to know the details of all of that, but they will be the ones who can make the calculation, right, the determination as to what the right level of marriage of those things are. And if they were to then do that and take responsibility for it, they would create the right, right relationship with the technologist in the same way today they have the right relationship with the human resources staff or the right relationship with the people who essentially provide legal advice and counsel. We need to create that same marriage between technologists who are not managing a commodity. They're managing the lifeblood of the company and the operators um, of that, uh, that company. When I said in the fourth instance that we're committed to the wrong goal, um, it's security as the goal. That's the wrong goal as opposed to defensibility. And the last thing I said is that we're hysterical about the wrong thing. And that's my notion that we're sometimes worried about this cataclysmic boom, thunder, thunderclap in the night when what we ought to be worried about is the slow rot that's already in the house. What should we do? My view is, is that we need to first and foremost think of this as a meld of three pieces. Think about this as a strategic issue. Think about this then in terms of the allocation of risk or opportunity. Both are combined. I'm across all three of these. And to begin to work this from the center of the company, right, the, essentially the board of the company, or in a kind of a military or a federal, um, federal government perspective in the same way from the head of the company out. Now, I'm going to talk in, in two ways about some specifics about that. I'm going to first talk, I'm going to play to my own bias, I'm going to first talk about this from a technology perspective, but then I would like to also cover the people in the process perspective in terms of solution space. These are 
somewhat tactical in nature in so much as you could look at any one of these as a look through the soda straw, but taken in sum and taken in the right order, I think they could constitute a strategy. So with respect to technology, my view would be that the first thing you ought to do in a business is to figure out what it is you're defending. What is it that is the core asset that you hold at risk by placing it in or running it on an infrastructure we know as cyberspace? Now, my personal view is, is that's probably the data. It might be your critical infrastructure, but the data is the embodiment of that wealth and treasure. That might not be the right answer, but you have to come to an answer before you're actually able to construct your business. If you do that, you then prioritize that data, and you then prioritize the critical capabilities that are dependent upon that data. This is the origin, this is the foundation, this is the source of strategy. If you don't do that, you're probably then left to the possibility you're going to defend all things with equal vigor, or you're perhaps going to defend nothing because you have no idea what's actually inside your system and what's held at risk. Follow that with a ruthless attention to detail, meaning that if at any moment in time your system is not as defensible as it possibly can be, then you're making it such that you have to depend upon either luck or invigorated reactive action in order to kind of cover any risks that come your way. So ruthlessly patch. Now that's hard to do because sometimes it has an impact on the performance of your business, but I would say the present performance of your business. There are any number of companies that have lived to learn that they wish they could go back in time and essentially do that patch so that they didn't have to then spend three times that or ten times that fixing of the problem that then ensued. Focus on behaviors, not transactions. Don't focus at the perimeter of your system or on the links of your system or on the operating system level of your system. Those are all places where you can knock down a lot of noise, you can do some useful work, but you have to fundamentally focus on the thing that's actually reconciling kind of access to privilege. If you were trying to protect an asset like your children, it might be useful to ensure that you lived in a house that had good physical security. It might be useful to ensure that you lived in a neighborhood that had good right, safety uh, parameters might be useful to ensure that you lived in a society that essentially respected civil um, discipline and, and good order. But ultimately, you'd be worried about where is my child? What's the status of my child? You know, is my child safe at this moment in time? You would never lose sight of the fact of what the core issue is. You would never allow some focus on an abstraction of their security to take you away from the notion that at the end of the day, the thing I'm really worried about is the security, the safety, the vitality of that child. In the same way, we need to have a ruthless focus in cyberspace about that thing that matters above all because that will then drive your actions at the abstractions. You need to share details and accountability for defense. I'll say more about that when I get to roles. But the system that you set up needs to make sure that everyone understands what their place is in that. And you can't do that by retaining responsibility for security in the hands of a precious small few. Partner with and across sectors. Right. If convergence is the reality of this space, this massive convergence of technology, this massive interdependence between physical systems of interest to us, then collaboration and integration, one's a human endeavor, the other's an engineering endeavor, are the right response. Absent the collaboration and the integration, you're going to find that the adversary looks at you as a system, has the advantage because they choose the time, the place, the manner of coming at you, and you are at that moment in time placed into a reactive mode where you have to figure out where the shot rang out, where you're perhaps going to go interdict that, how you're going to, how you're going to recover from that. And then finally, and this is perhaps the, the most sobering moment, you have to have a disaster recovery plan. You have to imagine that there will be a failure in your security system, your defense posture and your ability to defend it. It's going to happen someday that something gets into your system, something gets out of your system because it's been in your system. And if you don't imagine that day, then you'll be hard pressed to make the right response, whether it's your public affairs strategy, whether it's what you do to perhaps secure and safety the things that are most important in your system. But all of that depends upon having thought your way through that before the event occurs so that you can then do the right thing at that moment in time. But the more important piece of this is it allows you to actually think about that in a way that if you experience it vicariously, you can use the moment in time at this point to say, I need to make some further investments. I'm not sure I want to do that. I'm not sure that's a part of the thing I want to actually have to live through. So I'll make some investments now to make it, sure, make, make it so that I actually never get to that place. I never actually get to that nasty place. And what I would call this, if you do all of these things, or something akin to these things, this is security strategy 101. This is not a series of tactics. It's not a series of devices. This is actually having thought holistically through and melded these things
Marry that up then with the right talent pool and the right processes inside your organization, which I'll say a little bit about um, in the next slide or two. And I think you've got a reasonably defensible proposition that might then be well defended. Go into most companies today to include government organizations and ask them what their security architecture is for cyberspace, which you sometimes get as a substitute for this, is a slide, a PowerPoint slide that goes up and it's got a lot of icons on it. Each one of, each one of the icons is very colorful, very clever, li literally side by side, but it turns out that they don't cohere to each other, they don't cohere to a strategy, because each one of them was a tactic introduced at the moment in time you experience something, and the sum of those, which now equates to your security architecture, is neither coherent nor helpful against an adversary that can actually see through the seams, can hide in those seams, and take advantage of you because of those seams. So let's say a little bit more about the other two components, the people and the process. And to start with this, I'll talk a little bit about roles. Oftentimes when you ask about the responsibility for security, let alone cybersecurity in a company, ask a crowd like this, who's responsible for security? And the folks who have a security badge or who have security in their title hold up their hands, when in fact what we all know, at least in the physical world, is that everybody has a responsibility for security. As an individual living in any society, you have a responsibility to take care of the things that are closest to you, whether that's your car, whether that's your wallet, whether that's your cash, you take reasonable measures to protect that. Because the expectation is that's what you do. You rely at some distance from that on perhaps the police that are in your area to provide some civil order and discipline in the neighborhood, whether it's against speeding or you know, skullduggery. At some greater distance from that, there might be a military in your society that provides protection against external threats and perhaps disaster relief in times of natural disaster. At some distance from that, there might be people who are protecting the harbors, the ports, the airports. At some distance from that, there might be people who are looking for truly cataclysmic events and trying to thwart and, and tamp those down when they occur. In the case of the United States, there's a group of people that scans the skies over North Korea 24 hours a day, thank God. Um, and if a nuclear missile you know, was fired from there at some point in the future, we wouldn't take a referendum to determine whether we should do something about that. We'd knock that out of the skies at our first opportunity. The important thing about that particular lay down in the physical domain is all of those responsibilities are executed concurrently, side by side by side. And there's not a great deal of surprise from the individual to the organization to the nation state to coalitions of nation states as to what the complementary nature of all of those actions are in physical space. We really don't have the equivalent of that in cyberspace. Individuals are a bit confused about what their role and responsibility is, how much of what I do affects cybersecurity, how much of what I do can actually help cybersecurity. Organizations somewhat confused about their role. Governments and private sectors somewhat perhaps um, in a state of um, division of effort or dissonance about their roles and whether they complement one another. We need to get to a place where we actually create some concurrency in the application of all those responsibilities. We're not likely to do that from a position of theory alone. We're not likely to do that through exhortation to say, why don't you just collaborate? My view is, is in order to get to the right place, we're probably gonna to have to take on some real problems and solve those together in a collaborative fashion. Now I have a view about collaboration, um, which is that collaboration is different than division of effort, certainly division than perhaps contention resolution. Contention resolution says when we conflict, we'll then kind of figure out where the conflict came from, we'll solve it. Division of effort says, we'll figure out in advance, you do A, I'll do B, and then from that point forward, we agree not to collaborate, right? We don't need to collaborate, we've got a division of effort. The holy grail is collaboration, where we say, we're gonna go palms up, and we're gonna determine how do we actually, on common ground, because we're solving a problem that matters to all of us, achieve the true nature of collaboration, which is that we have professional intimacy, and we actually share with each other our insights about that, our potential solutions to that, in ways that are surprising to each other. I will suggest to you things that you wouldn't have had the thought to ask me about because having seen you face to face, knowing something about the nature of the problem you're really trying to work, I can now understand something about the questions you should ask of me. And I'll make an offer to you about perhaps how I can help in that regard and vice versa. That's collaboration. If we picked a real problem, maybe it's the defense of critical infrastructure for which government can make real and meaningful contributions, for which the private sector must make real and meaningful um, contributions. If we pick something like that and work that as a shared proposition between those sectors, we find ourselves before long actually developing solutions that are collaborative against that. 
and find ourselves not much further down the road developing shared trust relationships with one another that would then have a knock-on or a cascade effect on the other problems that we face in cyberspace. But the roles have to be addressed from the individual to the organization to nation states, plural, right? We have to do all of that. And people, people in my view are the weak link of cyberspace and they're the salvation of cyberspace. It starts and ends with people. If an adversary is looking at you in cyberspace, more often than not, they're going to find the way in, first and foremost, through people. The vast majority of the frailties, the vulnerabilities in cyberspace are attributable to human action. Right behind that, to procedures that have been set up where there are perhaps mismatched expectations about two parties dealing with one another, and the seam in between is something an adversary takes advantage of. And while there's a lot of talk about zero-day vulnerabilities and all sorts of frailties in hardware and software, those are much less utilized in terms of the gross numbers than the first two. Save the zero days for the advanced persistent threats, which are still going to be there, but we address them through the collective action of nation states, plural, and societies, essentially crowdsourcing that problem. What I want to get off the field is the 80% of the things that you can get by just doing the due diligence, the common sense things up front. So let's talk a little bit about people. If you take a look from an engineer's view, and I was a mechanical engineer in my first life, and a computer engineer in my second life, and a manager in my third life, meaning that I kind of essentially uh, moved to a position where I do nothing at all. Um, but if you look at it from an engineer's perspective, if you were to educate somebody in cyber, these are the relevant disciplines. And I mean cyber in terms of the nature of how it's constructed, how you make the networks work, how you make the software, the hardware on top of that work. They would tell you that the relevant things are you need to know something about physical systems, you need to know something about programming, you need to know something about data structures, network, and this thing called security, which is how do you imbue the software, the hardware, and perhaps the composition of that with properties that would make it perhaps resilient, resilient against some amount of threat. But it turns out if you're an adversary, you're taking advantage of more than this. You're taking advantage of more than the frailties that would be introduced if you did this poorly. If you're an adversary, you're actually going to take advantage of the people and the process components. And so if you turn that around, you now have to think about how do I train somebody to be resilient and robust in the face of that adversary? You have to add these to the curricula. You have to add these to the education, the training, or perhaps just your general education of the employees in your workplace. You have to actually add the notion of you're not just operating against national disaster. You're not just operating against those unintended failures that might crop up in a piece of software and hardware because it hadn't imagined that we would get to this time and place. You're dealing with a living, breathing adversary who's coming at you and is attempting to express audacity and initiative against you, trying to prevail against you in your own space. And if you don't have a discussion about what that looks like, how that works, what the psychology of that is, and you're probably hard pressed to actually face up to it and deal with it. You have to talk about social and human factors, both benign and malevolent, such that you understand something about the nature of human affairs conducted in and through cyberspace. And you certainly have to talk about policy, law, and ethics because we want people who actually do the right thing the right way. There's no, there's no benefit to actually trying to figure out how to prevail, but doing so in a way that's either unlawful or inappropriate or unethical something that you're not proud of. And so you need to figure out how do you do all of those things. It's possible to do all of these things. But that's, I think, the nature of education that we need for the people who design, build, and operate these systems, which means everybody. But you can't train everybody to be an expert. So I'll just give you an example. Um, I teach at the moment in what's called the Cyber Institute at the United States Naval Academy. We have 4,500 students there. It's essentially a college of sorts. They show up at the age of 17. They graduate at the age of 21. It's about 1,000 in each year's class. Um, and it's much like a college where there are about 20 different majors offered to them. And they can choose to major in anything from English to Arabic studies to nuclear engineering to now cyber operations. And the curriculum that we've installed doesn't simply address the people who want to study cyber in its own right, but it addresses all of them, which I think is the foundation for education that is required in the larger societies, plural. Um, and so we have an all many and few approach, starting at the all, Everyone at that institution, no matter what their major is, if they say, hey, I'm only interested in political science, I really didn't come here for the math, they still have to take two courses in cyber. And those courses don't so much beat them about the head and shoulders with the technology aspects of cyber. There's a fair amount in there that says, here's how the technology really works so that they understand 
the truth of cyberspace, how it really works, but most of what's talked about in those courses is, and here are the implications for whatever you might do in life, whether you're going to go fly an airplane or drive a submarine or perhaps um, be, a, be a, an officer in charge of a, a platoon or a company of, of Marines. We teach them about the implications to operations by the dependence of those operations on cyber. So what they do is they come out perhaps a bit more educated about the reality of cyberspace. Because here's what we've learned, is that the digital generation, the digital natives raised in the proximity of all this technology actually don't understand as much about this technology as you might imagine. The technology is so intuitive, it's so easy to use, that they actually have assumed it's a commodity. And when you ask them, where do you think your data is, many of them, well, it's in that device. Of course it's not in that device, it's in the cloud. But they don't need to know what the cloud is because somebody else has managed that. And if this device doesn't work, it's a commodity, throw it away, get a new one. They therefore begin to make choices about how to insert their data, how to rely upon data that comes out of it, that perhaps defy the reality of what's really happening to that data. Now, I was a C-130 pilot for 21 years in the Air Force. The first C-130 I ever flew was a C-130B model. The last one I ever flew was a C-130J model. In the military, the letter has something to do with the variant of technology that you employ. So the B model was a much earlier variant of technology than the J model. The B model had technology in this airplane, this 20th century marvel, had technology that dated back to 1650. Right? It had something called a sextant. If you want to know where you were in a C-130B model flying across the ocean, the way you determined that was you would literally stick a brass sextant into a hole in the roof of that airplane. You would shoot the moon, the sun, the stars. It was an arcane art you know, performed by magicians called navigators. Um, and then you would determine, plus or minus the state of Texas, where you were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Turns out that's good enough in 1975, 1985, because you only needed to be plus or minus 24 miles when you came across, when you came ashore. Good enough. But the thing that was really good about that is it gave you this tactile sensation, this palpable sensation of the nature of the Earth and the progress of things across the Earth and the relationship of the stars and the constellations to where you might be on the planet Earth, you developed an intuitive appreciation for how things moved with respect to one another spatially. Fast forward now to the C-130J model. You walk onto that, brand new car smell, it's a pretty nice airplane, liquid crystal displays, heads up displays, you literally could see all the avionics information you needed looking through the screen of the airplane itself. At the same time you're looking out at the Earth and all the things that are out there, Sweet, but there's no navigator, right? That person's been removed. There's no engineer, the person who used to essentially tell you what the airplane's you know, status was, whether the engines were healthy, whether it's a good vibration or a bad vibration in the engine quadrant. They're all gone, and you asked, where'd they go? They're in a box. They're in this box right here called the inertial navigation system or the GPS navigation system. And it will tell you where you are, plus or minus three feet. It's a great and magical thing. But if they don't work, the pilot doesn't know how to use the sextant, never did, actually, in plain truth. Um, there's no hole in the ceiling anymore because you took that out so that you could get an additional knot per hour on the airplane to remove that drag. The backup, if the inertial navigation or if the GPS doesn't work, is nothing. Well, you would say that's fine because this has been engineered to a fairly well such that that'll never happen. Never's a bad word, especially in flying. And those things weren't necessarily designed to be successful in the presence of an adversary. Introduce an adversary, you then say, well, I, I'm still fine because this is disconnected. Remember the earlier conversation, nothing is disconnected in this world. Those systems actually take information from outside the airplane, whether it's density altitude, whether it's altitude, whether it's pressure, whether it's wind speed, whether it's drift. Might in fact be some telemetry that they take from outside to be a component of some larger force, but there are streams of information into that airplane. And when you begin to consider how that really works and whether there is in fact a lane or a window through which an adversary could do something to this airplane. You think that we have advanced our technology to the point where the primary function is very sweet. Three people managing an airplane used to be managed by six plus or minus three feet for an airplane that used to do plus or minus the state of Texas. That's a sweet proposition. But it turns out it's a dangerous one if you've not considered this in the presence of an adversary and in the presence of the human components of cyberspace. So to some degree, we need to take a half step back and think about these things in that context. And to do that, we need people that are reasonably well-educated in all of that.
And that's what we do in this all portion of the pyramid. Everyone, no matter what you're going to do uh, as your ultimate career, gets an education in those components. The many is we try to make sure that across the rest of the courseware at the United States Naval Academy, whether it's in an engineering curricula, whether it's in a systems engineering curricula, whether it's in a political science curricula, we make sure that every opportunity we get to insert cyber, some aspect, some kind of um, reference to cyber, we do so. In the political science, it might be, what's the role of nations in collaborating to establish norms within this realm we call cyberspace? Because the norms today aren't well defined within any nation state, let alone across nation states. And that's going to be led by disciplines like political science, like diplomatics, uh, diplomatic relationships, more so than it's going to be led by the technologists who frankly don't have any idea how that works. We need to make sure, therefore, all of these disciplines that are going to have a role to play in the creation of the kind of cyberspace we want do. And then finally, we have a cyber operations major. Of the 20 majors that we have at the Naval Academy, about 50 or 60 kids a year choose that as their major. Now, what's interesting about that is the people who gravitate to that major, who study the things around that circle that I showed you earlier and get a Bachelor of Science in Cyber Operations, they don't typically get stolen away from computer science programs or engineering programs. What they would have majored in if they hadn't majored in this are systems-oriented um, disciplines like political science, like operations research, like systems engineering because they tend to be holistic thinkers. They tend to be people who say, I want to actually figure out how multiple things come together to create something of consequence, something of benefit, right, in the world. And those systems thinkers, we give enough of the details of how cyberspace works that they have a solid technical foundation, but then we add those other components so that they actually can figure out how do I then actually design systems, whatever those systems might be, to succeed not in cyber operations, but operations. They might be financiers someday, they might run a market someday, they might be a hedge fund manager someday, they might be a diplomat someday, they might be officers someday in the United States military. All of those are better prepared to succeed in whatever that operation is because they've actually had this foundational right, um, understanding, this foundational education in cyber. So it's cyber, small c, operations, big O, right, as the major, which we think is a solid foundation for their future no matter what they do. And it turns out when they graduate, they go to all sorts of different occupations within the United States Navy and Marine Corps. And in so doing, um, we're infusing into those, those services um, some depth of expertise in this discipline, which we think will ultimately make a difference. This might not be the right answer for other institutions, given the Naval Academy has a particular destination in mind for its kids. But I think it's a decent answer in terms of how we then begin to approach education, an all, a many, and a few um, answer. Because in truth, everyone needs to know something more than we know today as individuals about cyberspace and what we can and should do to make a difference. Many have a need for some additional information, whether they're lawyers or engineers or literally um, cyber, um, you know, cyber people. And there are a few who ought to study this in great depth so that they have a depth of expertise that they can apply side by side with the other disciplines in any business, whether that's the military or some other, that might make a positive difference. Having said all of that, um, I'll conclude just by um, offering uh, the following, which is when it's all said and done and we measure whether we've been successful in this or not, the question is often asked is how would I spend the next dollar of my money to achieve some material objective benefit right in cyber? It's a hard question. I suspect that would come up in the question and answer session, so I'll answer it right now, which is I don't know. I honestly don't know. Here's what I do know, that the money you're spending now probably is not being spent this is the choir, so I suspect everyone in this room is, but, but outside this room. The money you're spending today is probably not attributable to a cybersecurity strategy, or better yet, a company security strategy, or better yet, a company strategy. It's probably not yet optimized for whatever that strategy is, and that's the place to start. Don't spend another dollar before you figure out whether you have a company strategy that then allocates to the technology and people process your expectations about what they'll do, and then within that understands what risks are incurred, not simply the opportunities. Operators think well about that, but what are the risks that are incurred, and then determines whether those risks are acceptable. That, in my view, is an appropriate definition of the word security, or what I would prefer to say creates a defensible architecture that then must be defended by human beings, and then ultimately has to be something that you kind of exercise over time as a 24-hour-a-day proposition.
No such thing as something that defends itself. It has to be engaged in human beings. So having said that, I think uh, Chris will rejoin me on the stage and we'll take questions and answers for the rest of the time. Thank you. That's, am I on? Chris, thank you very much. So folks, we have about 15 minutes uh, for some questions for Chris uh, following uh, the presentation. Uh, Raymond, do we have some mics out and about for folks? Great. So with that being said, do we have anyone who would like to start? If not, I have a question, but I'd like to leave it out to someone in the audience. Hello, uh, my name is Ihab Khalifa uh, from Future Center for Advanced Research and Studies. Actually, what I'd like to say is that technology is going very fast. We are moving from Internet of Things to Internet of Everything, from 3D to 4D printers, from uh, Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi technology. Uh, DNA is used. It can be used to store billions of gigabytes in less than one gram. Also, algorithm has more control over our life, not only in search engines or news feeds, social media, but also in uh, robots, drones, and driverless cars. So is that necessary to have like a cyber range and where uh, new technologies can be tested, uh, if, uh, legislations can be evaluated, and uh, capabilities can be built? Thanks a lot. Yeah, so, so I understood the question properly. Um, it's a great question, which is you know, the role and utility of a cyber range, a place where you can perhaps test um, in an operational context, uh, where you can take risk, you can suffer calamities, and then learn from those as opposed to real damage occurs. Um, I think that's a profoundly um, rich and, and good idea. Uh, there are such things in the world. Um, my caution in the use of those is they are illustrative as opposed to exhaustive in, in what lessons they will teach you. Um, kind of if you practice on a cyber range, then you're kind of in a much more realistic environment in terms of the lessons you can learn and apply to the real world. But it won't tell you everything. It won't imagine all the possibilities that will happen to you. So it informs your muscle memory. It informs your intuition. It gives you some sense of what the best practices are. Um, and it will prepare you for those surprises that will occur. Um, you'll know something about the territory as opposed to the particular path that you intend to take across that. And when we get knocked off course, you'll know where you are and you get back to it. Um, so there's enormous value to those. Any other questions? We have one in the back. Thanks for the presentation. That was very good. I'm Michael Prejean from the Hudson Institute, Washington, D.C. Just had a question about your respect disparity comment about Iran. Uh, some would argue they've been showered with respect to secure the Iran deal, yet they've been more provocative than ever. Can you give us another reason why Iran has been attacking U.S. systems, uh, excuse me, besides the respect disparity? But one reason might be that Iran feels like it's the victim and that uh, they have been, uh, they have fallen prey to some number of attacks on their integrity, whether that's the physical integrity of um, the assassination of nuclear scientists, um, whether it's the application of sanctions, financial sanctions, which uh, were very deleterious to their society, and that they're simply responding to that. Um, I think the view, though, taken by um, the United States and, and other um, nations would be um, that those were appropriate consequences for behaviors of Iran, but perspective matters. And if you stand in their shoes and you look back, uh, they might say that they're simply acting um, in response using the means that are available to them, cyberspace. At the end of the day, the reasons don't matter as much as the means by which they're exercising that grievance and the consequences if that's not well defended, if cyberspace is not well defended. If you're Saudi Aramco and you lost 30,000 computers one day because of a virus that wiped them all clean, um, you have to deal with that mess. doesn't matter why it happened. It happened. And not having been prepared for that and defended against that, you then have to essentially react um, and clean it all up. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that there are, there's a time and place when you think about what motivates people to do this, uh, but in cyberspace we have to deal more with vulnerability than with threat. Vulnerability being the theoretical possibilities of some problem in that space, threat being the actual material existence of somebody that intends to do something. The distance between vulnerability and threat is so small that if you're not prepared to deal with vulnerability, it'll be too late when you see threat. We have a question back. 
Uh, my name is Khaled Salah. Thank you, Chris, for this uh, valuable insight and information. I, I, teach, uh, I'm, um, I teach network security. Most of what you said uh, there is about defenses, you know, and trying to uh, have s students empowered with the skills for defenses, deterrence, and stuff like that. Since, uh, since you're, you were involved in the National Academy, your Navy National Academy, do you teach students skills or empower them with skills for offense capabilities? Uh, you have to. You, you have to tell. So, so the question was, do you teach as much as you might teach them how to defend themselves in that space? Do you teach them how they might execute offensive activities in that space? The answer is you have to, not because that's the primary goal of equipping someone so that they can provoke um, or impose consequences, but so that they understand the mentality of that. It's a different mentality than simply defending. Um, you have to actually understand what the offense's mindset is, what the, mind, what the offense's capabilities are, uh, their ability to choose the time, the place, right, um, of, of an attack, so that you understand from the defender's perspective how perhaps you should array those defenses, prepare those defenses. More often than not, what it teaches the defense is that they can't simply react, right? That, that's a fool's game. You have to actually anticipate. You have to be on the front balls of your feet. You have to understand something about the neighborhood that you're in before the event occurs in order to have any meaningful um, effect with that. In the course that we teach to freshmen at the Naval Academy, everyone has to take it. Uh, we actually spend the first third of that teaching them how to networks work, individual devices, two devices working together, sets of devices, essentially program those so that they can make a meaningful uh, network then. We teach them how to actually do reconnaissance on that network. Google might call it simply kind of you know, servicing their index. Um, an adversary might say that's you know, preparatory to an attack, but we teach them how to essentially understand what the status of the network is. Then we teach them how to attack that network. We teach them how to actually do something of an aggressive nature to bring it down to affect right, its ability to support some larger operation. And then we teach them how to defend the network. We do that in that order because it turns out that they're harder in that order. Right? Reconnaissance is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, attack is a little bit harder, but not, not as hard as defense. And we save defense for last because it's the high moral ground. It's, the where, it's where we end the course and because it's the hardest thing to do. But if they didn't understand the first two, the reconnaissance and the attack, they would not be prepared mentally or in terms of the skill set um, to actually defend themselves um, against an attack in that space. So ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're just about out of time. So with that, Chris, I'll say on behalf of everyone here in the audience, thanks so much. For Great. That, for the, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.